and we're going to look at verse number eight. I'm reading out of the New American Standard Bible because I like it. <laughs> that translation uh, will be on the screens as well. Uh, so feel free to join along with us. It says, Now there came a day when Elisha passed over to Shunem, and there was a great woman, a prominent woman, a woman of reputation there, and she persuaded him to eat food. And so it was, as often as he passed by, he turned in there to eat food, and she said to her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God passing by us continually. Please let us make a little walled upper chamber and let us set a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand and it shall be when he comes to us that he can turn in there. One day he came there and turned into the upper chamber and rested and then he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him and he said unto her, say unto her now, behold, you have been careful for us with all this care. What can I do for you? Would you want to be spoken of to the king or the captain of the army? And she said, no, I live and dwell among my own people. So he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi, I answered and said, truly, she has no son and her husband is old. And he said unto her, call her. And when he called her, she stood in the doorway. Then he said, at this season next year, you will embrace his son. And she said, no, my Lord, O man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. And the woman conceived and bore a son that season in the next year, just as Elisha had said unto her. Now, we'll continue with this story in a minute. Uh, but here's the first thing I see about this great woman. Uh, and it's the thing that so many of you have brought to us. And it is this. She esteemed spiritual things and brought those spiritual things into her household. She valued, she esteemed spiritual things, and she brought those spiritual things into her household. And out of this, it opened up something for her family that would have not opened up to her family any other way. There was nothing she could do in the natural to open this thing up. Um, it had to be born of the Spirit, but because she esteemed these spiritual things, opened up her life uh, and home to these spiritual things, because she took the initiative to do this, it enabled God to do something, not just for her, but God to do something for the whole household. Um, and so this point to me is just, it, it's so critical because what we see this woman do is she's sensing that not only is a man of God passing by, but on the man of God is God himself. And I, I think in all of our lives, if we're being honest, God is passing by us. We looked at this last week where God says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. That in each one of our lives, God is kind, trying to come in and visit us and asking you to turn your attention to him and invite him into your home. And this woman invited this spiritual force into her home and he visited and then he left and then he would visit and then he would leave. And finally she said, you know, it's not enough for him to visit. I want him to dwell here. And so she took the initiative to pay the price and to sacrifice and to build out something into her home where not only could God visit, but God could dwell. She esteemed these spiritual things so strongly uh, that she sacrificed whatever she had to to make this happen, not just in her life, but in her family. Now here's what's interesting, is the byproduct of this was something she was not even contending for. Uh, this was not something that was on her radar or something that she noticed. This was just something that she determined, like, yeah, I need to do this. And out of doing this, it opened up something in the natural where the man of God comes to her and says, well, what is it that you need? And she's like, well, in the natural, I have everything that I need. And so he's pondering, like, well, what can be done for her? And finally, someone speaks up and says, you know, she has something in her life that she's always tried to produce that up till now she's been unable to produce and this spiritual thing unlocked that thing for her life. And I feel like so many of us are trying to unlock some physical things by purely trying to do physical things. That we're wanting to see progress with some things physically, and so we're trying to embedder ourselves physically. And I think God would come to us and say, if you would drop some of those physical things so that you could pick up some of these spiritual things, when you pay attention to these spiritual things, it'll open up the door for you for some of these natural things. Uh, and out of that, enable God to do what only God can do. 
Uh, and so this woman pays attention to this, and it changes literally not just her life, but the life of everyone in her family. Uh, now, I have been blessed in my life to see women of God be women of God and to esteem spiritual things. Uh, and when I say that, I don't say it lightly. Like, I grew up with a, a mother uh, who literally uh, would worship uh, in the car uh, and she would drive with her knees so that she could lift both hands to the Lord. I, I still don't know how she did it, uh, and it scared me every time. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> uh, and uh, that kind of thing. But this was my mom. If you ever knew or have seen my mom worship, you know just how much she loves the Lord. And she would open herself up to him and esteem these spiritual things. It would not be uncommon for me to come downstairs in the morning and see her in her chair. In fact, always by her chair was an amplified Bible. Uh, and in this amplified Bible, it was written in, it was highlighted in, but it was also, long before email or social media, there was actually another way of communication. It was called physical mail. And so in physical mail, you would like go to your mailbox, you would open it up, and there would be like letters in there from ministries and partners and newsletters and like all those types of things, because there was no internet. What a world! And yes, I am old enough to remember when there was no internet. Uh, and so out of that uh, like I can remember like my mom reading all of these articles and having them like on the counter and in the Bible in fact the artwork in our house was scripture <laughs> like, it, it literally was every the paintings in our house were paintings of Jesus and Red Sea you know parting and all these things and it wasn't because she was a pastor's wife she genuinely loved the Lord now, if you're new to the church, you've never heard these stories before, congratulations. If you've been in the church, you've heard me tell these stories before. And if you stay in the church, you're going to keep hearing me tell these stories because it's the fabric of my faith, and I try to be authentic when I communicate. Uh, so um, my mom and father, when they started, started with nothing. They, they genuinely started with nothing. Their first table was made out of plywood and cinder blocks. Uh, the car was in such bad shape that it had to have a broomstick behind the driver's seat just to keep the driver's seat staying up. Uh, like, it was, it was bad. Uh, but God came in with a mighty hand and took this couple. My father was a drug addict, never graduated high school, um, got saved and filled with God's spirit, met my mom at a Christian bookstore, and their life and family began. Uh, and out of this... Uh, if you were to look at it from the natural and say, like, how successful this church plant would be, you would have never imagined that all of this would have come out of that. Um, they didn't have the training, they didn't have the seminars, they had no money, they had no real strong connections, they had none of those things. But one of the things that they did have was a true esteem for spiritual things. My father and mother, they chased after God. They went to meetings every time they could go to meetings. Before they were famous, uh, like in a church type of community or sat on the front row, I can remember going and sitting on like the back row uh, and all those types because they just loved the Lord. They wanted to get in in the middle of spiritual things. They knew that spiritual things valued and they cared about those spiritual things more than they did those natural things. And when I look back at like what the church did to become all that God made it today, I can point to a couple of natural things, but I'm telling you behind the fabric of each one of those natural things was these moments of spiritual surrender and spiritual honor where they honored the Lord with their life, they honored the Lord with their worship, they honored the Lord with their art on the walls. Uh, and out of this, um, this spiritual devotion and this spiritual attention paved the way to natural promotion. Um, and, and I want to encourage you that oftentimes throughout Scripture, spiritual devotion equals natural promotion. Uh, and our goal should never be the natural promotion. It should always be the spiritual, promotion, uh, spiritual devotion. But I'm telling you, when you draw near to God, God draws near to you. When you seek first the kingdom of God, it opens up the world and all the things that the Gentiles seek. Like when you honor God, God honors you. When you build a little chamber on your wall for God to dwell in, God will fill the whole house and bring a miracle to the house. 
And I am so thankful for the ladies in my life who have understood this and have brought this to all of us Sims men. Like if you were to ask me like behind uh, the church and kind of seeing what made it word of life, like when, when we were there, there were a lot of things that I could point to, and, you know, on stage and that type of thing. But I'm telling you behind it all was a praying woman, a devoted woman, a woman who was bringing grace and strength and life to everything that she was in. Uh, my, um, uh, I, I was thinking about this with my wife uh, and um, those types of things and um, just because I see my wife kind of do the same things in our family and to, to come where she esteems these spiritual things. And I think like never before, and I watched it all like literally play out this morning, <laughs> like never before we have so much pressure uh, on um, ladies today to be Martha. And to be like very good at uh, personal presentation, the presentation of our children, the presentation of our jobs, the presentation of, of homes, the presentation of life. Um, and there's so much attention to those things. Like for my wife today, she has a devotional, she has coffee with me, but then the day is a jump start of like coming into like getting this child ready and this child ready. And then, oh, by the way, myself ready. Uh, and like, all, and me ready. Like, I'm like, does this match? Uh, like, all of these kinds of things. And she's trying to get ready. Uh, but like, so much of these things that take attention to like all these natural things. Um, and the constant lie of the enemy saying this natural thing is not enough and this is not enough and this is not enough and all the while Jesus I think is calling to us and, and asking us to do something and I, I don't think this is just for ladies I think this is for all of us but I think the heart of Jesus is to come to us and say there is many things you feel like you have to do but there is one thing that is needful and that is to come and esteem spiritual things. And by sitting at my feet in this house, you will bring something to this house that your cooking couldn't bring, your organization couldn't bring, uh, all of the management couldn't bring, your job couldn't bring. There is something when we esteem these spiritual things that it blesses the whole household. Um, and like I, I was praying about this yesterday and just in praying about it I really sense like the Holy Spirit kind of unveiling this even for me and like teaching this to me because I never really thought about this before but even in the first temptation when you see uh, Satan come on the scene and he is trying to attack uh, God's people and attack God's children the first thing he attacks is not Adam or their kids the first thing he attacks is Eve and you know what he attacks? He doesn't attack her marriage. Um, you know what he attacks? He attacks her relationship with God. That the first attack, the first temptation ever in Scripture was Satan coming to a wife um, and Satan coming to a woman and attacking her confidence in her father God, trying to separate her from her father, knowing that if I can separate this woman from her father, I can separate literally everything else in the family. Uh, and I just want to encourage you that I know in your life, uh, we and society put so much pressure on moms and ladies to be this and that and this and that. And I understand all of those things, but I'm telling you the greatest thing you can do for you, the greatest thing you can do for your family, the greatest thing you can do for your children, the greatest thing you can do for whatever you're doing is taking the time to esteem these spiritual things bring them into your household because that spiritual devotion from you is going to bring spiritual and physical promotion to everything about you and your household uh, the second thing that I see is she knew her child not only needed her but her child also needed the Lord um, and we see this kind of play out. She has the child, and it says this in, in 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse number 18. It said, when the child was grown, the day came that he went out to his father, to the reaper. So he's like, I'm going to teach you how to work. Uh, and 19, he said to his father, my head, my head. And what theologians tell us here is that he probably had like a sunstroke um, and got too hot. 
and he said to his servant, carry him to his mom, because that'll fix it. Have you ever done that as men? It's like, I don't know what to do, go see your mom. Uh, so <laughs> it's like, go take him to his mom. Uh, and out of this, the mom gets him. Now, kind of watch the severity of this moment. And, and once again, let's not just read this, but let's try to have empathy with this woman uh, of what's about to kind of play out in this scripture. Uh, because all of this is written in scripture not to um, entertain us, it's written to instruct us. And she's about to have something come up in the life of one of her children that is very scary. Uh, and she's about to have something come up in the lives of one of her children, because there is a thief, it's not God, but there is a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Uh, there is a spiritual force in the earth that wants to pull everything down. We see that with gravity naturally, but that gravity also exists spiritually that causes storms and things to come up in our life. And you know, if you're a mom, especially, it's one thing for something to attack you. It's a whole other thing for something to attack one of your children. And her child is about to be under attack. It's going to be very scary for her. It's going to be very emotional for her. Uh, it's going to be something that's very dramatic. Uh, and watch what this response is from this great woman. Uh, when he had uh, taken him and brought him to his mother, verse 20, he sat on her lap until noon and then died and she went up and she laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out now this is very interesting if you read this next what she goes after in this moment is God she goes after the man of God and and when he is on her lap she's coming to this conclusion that this is not enough that what I can give this child in my own strength, the care I can give this child in my own strength, the love, the devotion, um, the nourishment that I can give this child in my own strength is not going to be enough for this child. That he needs more than my lap. And when he dies, she places him in the room where the presence of God was, not on her bed, but the man of God's bed, and then she runs after God. She got a miracle that day. And you're going to have these moments when you're a parent, you're going to have these moments when you're a mom with kids young and old, with kids who are in school and kids who are grown, where you're going to see their life go through storms. And I'm telling you at that moment, us dads, we're going to send them to you moms. Like, we're going to be like, go see your mom. I don't even know where to start. I can't even spell it. Uh, so like, go see your mom. Uh, but there's going to be a moment where even with you, you're going to feel like you're not enough. And you're going to have these moments where you're going to see they need more than your care. They're going to need the voice of a heavenly father. They're going to need the power of the living God on their lives to turn it around. Uh, and out of this, I am so thankful for, for women all around me in my life who have known this and who have done this, from a sister to a wife to a mother to a grandmother, who have come in and just made Jesus the focus point of our life. My mom trained us not just to go to her, my mom trained us to go to church. Uh, and amen. Um, and I know, like, it, it's, it's amazing to me because I'm 38 years old and I have a, a lot of, you know, millennial friends and like that type of thing. And I'm watching, like, uh, you know, the, those of us who grew up in church, I'm watching how the enemy, very subtle, because if you think you see the enemy, you don't, uh, he's subtle. That's the first word to describe Satan. Not evil, subtle. Um, and so out of this, one of his silent temptations that I think he's trying to do in all of our families, for those of us who have young children now, is to make us esteem everything but God and church. Uh, that literally, we will sacrifice a lot to take our kids here and there and all these things. But I'm telling you, if there's one thing my mom did, she sacrificed to take us to church with her time I know she was tired I know with like youth camps and all these other types of things she's like you will go and now that I'm paying for youth camp I'm like I never imagined youth camp would be so expensive uh, like all of these things like I called her the other day I'm like you sacrificed more than I ever gave you things for now that I am a parent I know um, but like all these things she made God the center point of our lives and here's why this is powerful, because there was a time in this life of this child where he needed more than the physical touch of his mother. He needed the touch of a living God. He needed a God to come in his life and breathe life back on him. 
Uh, and I know for my mom, like one of the things, like I, I remember the Wednesdays. First Wednesdays was Shoney. Second Wednesdays was Captain D's, the best little chocolate cakes you've ever had. Uh, the third Wednesday was Piccadilly. And the fourth Wednesday was Maranatha Christian Bookstore. And instead of buying just a meal, we will buy like a Christian CD or something along that line. But it was all on the way to church. She made church the center point. Of, our vacations were for Tulsa, Oklahoma to camp meetings. Like church was literally the fabric of our lives. Now, here are why, here's why this was important in my life and in, in, in the life of this child. Uh, is there was a came, came a time in my life where I felt like I had died, and it was when my father had died. And I can remember at 17 years old when my father died, and in that moment, something that I thought would be with me for forever, that all my dreams, hopes, and wishes were tied to, when that was taken out of my life, and I no longer had that foundation, and I found this moment of pain. My mom couldn't do for me what she needed to do because this was the only man she had ever kissed. It was the only man she had ever dated. And so she was going through her own storm. I'm 17 years old. And I'm trying to figure this out in my own life. And there were many things that I was tempted to turn to in that season. Many things that had I turned to it would have been destructive, would have done evil. And I don't know if I've been stand, it would be standing here before you today. But you know what I turned to in that moment? I turned to church and I turned to God because that's the thing I had been brought to my whole life. And I'm telling you, I can remember being in church and receiving healing and being in church and receiving life and being in church and receiving strength and, and God literally healing and restoring something in me because my mom knew, like, yes, he needs me, but he also needs to be on the, man of the, the, the bed of the man of God. Like, yes, he needs me, but he also needs to be in the presence of God. Yes, he needs me, but he also needs to be in worship. He also needs to be in youth camps. He also needs to be in children's church. Yes, he needs me. But I'm not just going to church for me. I need to bring my kids to church. Like, yes, they need me. They need me to be a good mom. They need me to be a good dad. They need me to be good. But more than me being good, they need a great heavenly father. Uh, and so I will esteem these spiritual things. And I'm so thankful for ladies in my life who have understood this and people in my life who contended for this. I think of my grandmother. Uh, and, and my grandmother, like, having sons uh, go astray, like literal prodigals, like we talked about. And, and my dad coming home, and she's like, if you're coming home, you're not just coming home, you're going to church. And at a church meeting, him running down to the altar and giving his life to the Lord. What if she just brought him to herself and did not bring him to church? What if she just brought him to her and set her on, her on his lap, uh, him on her lap, and just told him it's going to be okay and did not bring him to God? She knew he needs more than me. I can't change this, but I know someone who can. And I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful to have a grandmother who made a decision to, to take him to that meeting because I look at like what's come out of that one decision and what's come out of that one moment and what God's doing not just in this generation but in the next generations and it all traces back to that moment. The third thing that I see this woman do is she fought spiritually for her family. She was the spiritual backbone of her family. She gets on a donkey and she rides as fast as she can to the man of God. And the whole time she's praying and confessing and it is well with me and it is well with my family and it is well with my children. She's fighting this fight spiritually. And, and, and I know, like, so many times in our lives, like, we, we go through seasons, but I'm just so thankful uh, that I had uh, spiritual just giants in my life of these, these women who would come and contend for things spiritually. And I know that so many of you in here have had mothers and grandmothers who were that for your families, and they passed away can I tell you that that mantle is still on the earth and somebody somewhere has got to pick up that mantle and say, you know what? I'm not just going to be a Martha for my family and have the perfect house and the perfect meal. I'm going to be a Mary for my family because I'm not just sitting at the feet of Jesus for my life. I'm sitting at the feet of Jesus for my children's life. I'm sitting at the feet of Jesus for my family's life. I'm sitting at the feet of Jesus for my grandchildren's life. I will sit here at the feet of Jesus and contend for these children she went to war spiritually 
And she brought life back to her family. She brought life back to her life. She brought life back to her sons because she knew how to fight spiritually. Um, I was thinking about this in, in my own life, and I'll close with this, and we'll take communion. Um, but years ago, when I was just a young man in my early 20s, uh, the church had finally stabilized, and um, I was at this place where, you know, it was nice to kind of have a little bit of peace, and, and you know, people stopped leaving the church, <laughs> all of those kinds of things. And um, I honestly was not thinking about family and marriage and that kind of thing. Um, and one night I was praying in the Spirit, walking across uh, my, my living room. And I had a vision, and I fell to my knees, and I had a vision, and I saw this Christmas tree. It's so funny, I never thought about this you know, quite this way. Like, even today, our family has, like, this fascination with Christmas trees and Christmas. And I'm like... Why did I never put two and two, to get, two, and two together until this week? Uh, but like I saw this Christmas tree and I saw um, a family around it. And I just saw the back of their heads and it's like these golden little heads. Uh, and I saw this, this mother and this wife like put her arms around these kids. And the only word I know for it is warmth because warmth is like it denotes like joy and peace and life and energy, but also like power because like when you have fire, you've got energy. And you, you, you kind of have this and like I, I see myself and I'm walking in that direction. I'm walking up on it. And God said, I'm about to bring somebody into your life. And if I didn't show you this, you would have said no. And I'm walking into this, this strength and this power coming from this uh, amazing woman kind of holding this family together, in the light of this moment. And I found myself thinking about this this week because the next day after that, my mom called me and she said, I got somebody I think you need to meet. I tell my kids, I believed in arranged marriages. I just want you to know it worked for me. <laughs> I've got somebody I want you to meet. And I met my wife, and three months later, I don't recommend it. Uh, <laughs> it worked for us beautifully, but I know we're the exception and not the rule. Uh, but three months later, we were married. And I told my wife today, I said, you have been all that. And that's the truth. She is the, the warmth of our home. She taught me how to have fun. She's the glue that keeps everything together. There's a light and a life that comes off her of this spiritual, beautiful strength that just fills all of our lives. And so many times I think our, our kids don't even know it, but this grace they're going to school with and this life I'm going to work with and all of these things that are happening is because of the fabric of it all is this warm light huddling a family around them, huddling a family around these moments, bringing life to all that it touches. And here's what's amazing to me. When I talk to people like my grandmother, or I talk to people like my mom or my wife, I find so often that the enemy shows them everything that they're not, all the times that they've missed it, and all the times they should have been better, and all the times they should have been more, and... I wrote my mom a, a real long letter and gave it to her last year about what she had meant to me. And she called me. She said, nothing could have meant more to me than what you, you gave to me. And talked to, talked to me about the shame she felt all throughout my life as a mom that she could have done more. She could have been more. And I found that that's not uncommon. And so if you're sitting here and you're thinking some of those things, let me just tell you right now, you are an excellent mom. You've been an excellent wife. You've been an excellent daughter. We salute the ladies and the women in our lives. We see who you are. There's not a one of us who hasn't been perfect. There's not a one of us who has gotten, hasn't gotten it all right. But I'm telling you, each one of us have missed it. But every one of us would not be where we are today without some very strong ladies sacrificing and paving the way for us to be who we are. And so on this Mother's Day, we honor you. We salute you. And we give God thanks for the gift of you. I'm going to pray today, and then after my prayer, I'm going to invite the campus pastors for it. I'll close out here at Lakeland with communion and worship. Father, we come before you, and we just thank you for the gift of Jesus today. We thank you for his body that was broken for us, and 
the blood that was shed for us. And Father, we thank you that today we humbly approach the communion table with honor and respect for what you blessed us with. And Father, we thank you uh, that so often times in life we'll see a love that mirrors your love. And Father, when I think of that type of sacrificial love, I think about all the moms who are here today who have sacrificed dreams, hopes, and desires for our dreams, hopes, and desires, who have come in with so much and sacrificed so much to bring us you. And so today, Father, we honor your son's broken body and shed blood. And we also honor those who brought Jesus, that broken body and shed blood, into our lives. Thank you for the moms and the grandmothers and the wives who have prayed for us. Thank you so much, Father, for the gifts you have given us and the gift of mom. And so today, Father, we ask while we worship and while we sing and praise that not only, Father, would you be glorified and honored, but Father, we also thank you that in this moment we can honor those who honored you by bringing you to us. We love you, Father, so very much. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.